ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in a very powerful text this morning. Not that the whole book hasn't been such, but uh, we're in a text that I, I personally find very appropriate for the timing and uh, very challenging as to its content. But uh, it's chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, and it's verses uh, 10 through 17, and I'd like to read that. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. There was a, a message preached by Dr. Uh, Neighbor, and in this particular sermon, it, it dealt with the possibility of one of God's children being saved so as by fire. And in the end, receiving no rewards when they stand before Christ. And on that particular Sunday, after he had preached this message, a uh, man, after the service, walked up to him and ultimately walked home with him. And he was a wealthy uh, businessman. And he said, well, I, you know, uh, I didn't really care for that sermon. I didn't like that the sermon held out the possibility that some Christians barely enter heaven so as by fire and then ultimately possibly could not receive rewards for their faithful service. Why, he said, went on to say, I, I, I'll be happy if I can just get there and lean on the walls. And about that time, they reached this man's grand home, a mansion, just beyond description for one man to have. And as they entered the, the, the house, it was decked out with all the luxuries that money could buy. Now the point here is this. How different was this wealthy man's thinking about his earthly abode. How different was that thinking in contrast to his thinking about his heavenly home? Many people say this very thing. We say it all the time. You know, if I can just get there, I'll be happy. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's not what Scriptures declare nor should it be the heart in which we live this life, more importantly. That if I just get there, I'll be happy if I can just lean on the walls and live our lives with that mindset. That's the issue this morning. The issue isn't just getting there, it's how we enter heaven. How we come before the Lord. That's where Paul's at in, in his discussion with the Corinthian church in this letter. We need to aspire, you and I, we need to aspire to enter glory abundantly and triumphantly. That should be our heart. That's, and, I, and I challenge you today, and I challenge my own heart, we need to really seriously ask that we live our lives in that manner. And quit playing games and talk around it and, and take in all the facts and all these things and never change a thing in our lives. Just keep plodding along the same. 
And I'm not saying if you're on the right path, that's great. But we should be pressing on. And you want to know something too? It's not wrong to be motivated with what we can leave sin on ahead. Paul even said that I press on toward the goal of the prize for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's not wrong to be motivated to, to please God in, in life, to want to please Him, and with the idea, too, that there's a reward in that. We're told in Scripture there are rewards, there's crowns to be won. There's a, there's a judgment coming when the Lord will reward us for how we live our lives. And so we should desire to come into that experience in the best shape we possibly can. And by the way, not for our glory, but for His. That we have crowns to cast back at His crucified feet. To lay back on Him for what He's done. That's the goal. To enter in, in abundance. This morning we come to a passage which is very familiar to most of us. I've read it to you. It's a passage which deals with the judgment seat of Christ and the rewards of the believer or loss thereof. It's a subject that's relevant to every one of us. Every one of us. This is one, I, I told Retta this morning, I said I, I, I hate it that we're in flu season, but you know God's in control, so everybody who's supposed to be here is here. But I wish it was packed to the, to the nines for what I gleaned. We all need to hear this. We all need to be reminded of this. And so I'm really thankful for God's timing. But this passage continues Paul's discussion. Uh, and the discussion, by the way, is, is uh, an issue of division in the church. Factions in the church, in the Corinthian church, the church of God at Corinth. They had problems, many problems, many issues. And they stemmed from carnality in their lives. But the discussion at hand has been on the subject of divisions. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm of Christ. They were saying these things and it exposed the carnality that was in their midst. Well, Paul, in relation to the divisions, this, this discussion and the issues of division, he shows how such a, a behavior on the part of believers, it affects their rewards from the Lord, the, the rewards that they could gain from the Lord at His return when He would call them uh, at the rapture and we face the Bema. And He drives home the, this truth that we ought to grab hold of this morning, each of us as individual believers. And I truly believe as a church because I believe we're all accountable individually but I also believe that the, the Word teaches a corporate accountability. That not only will you give an account for you, but we'll give an account for us. For Prairie Bible. Our footprint in this world for His glory or lack thereof. And how we live amongst each other as believers and within this lost world. What did prairie? What, what kind of believers were we? But what we learn here, and I'll make it more individual, and I'll tell you why in a moment, uh, but, but what we have here, by way of proposition, is every believer is accountable for service rendered on earth, for service rendered in this life. You and I will answer to our Lord for uh, our redeemed lives. We're going to answer for our, rele our redeemed lives and how we use them for Him. And we're ultimately going to be rewarded accordingly. That's what's in this passage. That's what's in, in this text. And in conveying this truth, Paul sets forth four principles. Four principles concerning the judgment of the believer's building, I, want, I will call it. The believer's works. But before we get into our text, let's first get a better 
picture of the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema. Okay, I'm not going to get real deep into the, 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 all of the, the passages because we don't have time for that if we're going to get through this, this portion. But we need to, we need to consider certain uh, points as it relates to the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. First one would deal with the question of when does it take place? When is this judgment of believers? Well, it's following the rapture and prior to the Lord's return. So when the Lord comes in the clouds and He calls us and, and snatches us up to meet Him in the clouds with the resurrected saints who've, who've just come before us, in a moment they're raised up and then we're caught up and we, we all come together in the air at the rapture. Between that, that moment and His return, to come back and establish His kingdom, there's a judgment. And we know that the, the tribulation period lasts seven uh, years. We know that. So we, 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 in that period of time, in that period of time, we're going to have a, a, a judgment of believers. I don't know that it'll take all that time. I'm not saying that. But when it occurs is then. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because the church... Upon coming with him, coming back with him is viewed as having already received its reward. We're, we're, we're already adorned with, with, with our reward. Uh, so it's during that time prior to when he comes back. And, and Revelation 19 speaks of, uh, uh, is, is the text in, in particular that shows the, the rewarded saints coming with him. Second question ha it has to do with who's involved here. At the Bema. Now, if you've, if you've been around the, this church very long, you already know who's involved. At this judgment, it's about our Lord, it's Christ, and His people, His church, us, the believer, the Christian, the church though. We're there. And it's the judgment upon us as believers. And this is a rewards judgment. The subject here is not God's judgment on sin. Will sin be in this, in this judgment? I believe it will. Because we're judged according to our deeds, whether good or bad. And when you talk about bad, well, bad, if it's not good, is sin. And so sin's there. So it's to say that there's not a sin issue. But sin as related to a condemnation issue is not at this judgment at all. At all. Because everybody at this judgment is a believer. The issue of our sin and the potential for condemning us that was settled at the cross when we came to Christ. We're not there for, for Him to decide whether He's going to save us or not save us. He saved us and the fact that we're there is proof of that. We're there forever. We're with Him. But that's the, the, that issue of, of condemnation, that's settled. Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There is none. So it's not a matter of, of, of settling the issue of your eternal state. That's already settled. This is an issue regarding uh, the believer and reward. And, and, the, and His Lord. That's what's there. Now, I don't know about you, but that's enough for me. That's a staggering thing for me. Just to contemplate that moment in the history of the universe. The one moment that Dan Larimore stands before the Creator of the universe who stepped down out of that place to die on a cross that I can stand here before Him. That's heavy. It's wonderful. But it's very heavy. It's very staggering to think about. It. And it should be viewed with that understanding. Sorry, folks. I wasn't going to be hassled by Him all morning. But it's a staggering moment in time. Third thing 
is the purpose of this. And this is, this is taking on... Uh, I haven't settled some issues here. I know what the purpose is, but I, I think there's something here that I, I, is new to me, and I'm not going to go heavily into this. But the purpose of this judgment is to make manifest the eternal or the temporal quality of our lives live for Him. It, 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 it is not... We, we've looked at this, and I have even, I've said under messages, and I've, I've, I've actually looked at this. What is, what is judged here is the structure that we've built, of, which is our life. What goes on is an exposure of the quality of that building. What's burning is not rewards. What's burning is what we built. The, 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 those, those elements in our structure that are eternal in quality, they're going to remain. And then those that aren't are burned up. And then what remains, we're rewarded accordingly. So it's not an issue where he's taking a reward and he, and, you, and he shows us you gained this, but poof, it's gone. No, what's happening is we've built, you and I, whether you know it or not, we're building a structure that, that he's going to look at and he's going to, it's going to pass through a judgment where the, the elements that we've built with are exposed. And they'll either last or they will burn. And in light of that, we're, we're rewarded accordingly. There's a reward or loss thereof. The fourth thing is the possible rewards here. What are these rewards? I mean, we're told in Scripture there are five different crowns. That are given. And they're specifically mentioned. There are five that are mentioned. But there's also, in this particular judgment as it relates to the believer, we also find in Scripture that position and responsibility in the kingdom hang in the balance at this judgment in light of how we come through this judgment. Whether you will be a, a governor... <laughs> Or a, I'm just using our temporal, you know, uh, offices to, to make the point. Whether we're governors or, or or presidents or princes or kings of provinces that it, within this new created world, what 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 that's going to be? We don't know, but it's settled here. What how we come out of this judgment will will establish my position, my my place. And my role within the kingdom experience. And in that regard, that's real heavy. <laughs> because we're told in Hebrews that for those who, who love Him and are living for Him, as we should, we are the Metachoi. We are His honored guests, His friends. Not just people who participate, but we're the honored guests. We're the ones recognized by the king as those honored individuals and were displayed in that status by our Lord himself in the kingdom. That's huge. That's huge. So, so position, responsibility, and then another is recognition from Jesus himself. Like I said, we're standing before the one who loved us so much that he gave himself upon the brutal cross of Calvary. And he's going to look at our lives and what, what we've done for him, there will be reward. He's recognizing that. It's a mind blower because we could have never done it, but by his grace and through his empowerment. But yet he rewards us. Isn't that something else? Amen. When you think about it, that he rewards us, even though he's the one doing it all. 
So now that we've looked at this information, let's go ahead and look at this first uh, principle here. The first principle in, in this regard and in this discussion is this. There's but one foundation on which the believer uh, should build. Look at verses 10 and 11. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. With this analogy of, of building, of structures, Paul starts off uh, with the most important aspect in any type of construction. I don't care what it is. If you're building furniture or you're building buildings, you start with a foundation. An internal structure. And for building, we're talking about a foundation. I didn't realize that, and this was really, in light of the horrible event of 9-11 that occurred with the World Trade Center, both towers coming down, I never realized how massive the foundations were. They're huge. They're monolithic, these foundations that go in. Why? Because it's got to support the, the structure. And it's the most important part of the building. And if you saw when they had to tear and clean up all of, all of the, 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 the debris, it took weeks just to core out that foundation. And what was left were these massive craters that were full of concrete and rebar and, and, and all that which would support the strongest element of the entire structure is that foundation. And that's what Paul starts with. And he says, this is what we start with. And for us, there's but one. There's but one foundation. What is it? It's the foundation of Jesus Christ himself. Now, Paul, as, as we look at this, he says he was a wise master builder who laid the foundation of the Corinthian church. But I want you to also notice that he doesn't take credit for this. He says it was a gift, gift of God because he says, according to the grace of God which was given to me. See, he didn't make it happen. He was just an instrument and he recognized that. I was an instrument through which this foundation was laid. He didn't take any credit for himself. He gave it all back to God. But Paul realized that others would continue to build upon that foundation. And he ultimately offers a word of caution. He says, but let each man be careful how he builds upon it. Now, I want to say this. In the strict sense of this passage, Paul is speaking to evangelists, potential evangelists, pastors, pastor teachers, those who'd come and build upon the foundation that was laid at Corinth. In, in, in its strict sense, you could make a case, that's who he's talking to. Those who would continue to build upon the foundation that Paul had laid, that, that foundation. But the context, the context also indicates that there is a broader application that must not be missed here. And that broader application is the inclusion of you and I by the each man and any man of verses 10 through 18. It's all over the place. So he's not just talking to only pastors. He's saying... Once we've come to Christ, no matter who lays that foundation, there's only one, and it's Jesus Christ. And when that foundation is laid, everybody needs to take caution from then on how we build upon that foundation. How am I building on that? And it applies to every believer. All of us, by what we say, what we do, and, and, and to some extent, teach the gospel. That's what we're about. That's how we're to live. It's our lives. How we've used our ransomed souls that he paid for. What we do going forward. 
We're all to be careful builders, and the foundation that we build upon, we're to be mindful, is Jesus Christ. That's what he says there in verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is, is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ is the foundation of our lives after, after salvation. He is the chief cornerstone. He's what we build upon, and there is no other. The only, and I say this, the only foundation of biblical Christianity that's recognized by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. So that, that rules out a lot of religious systems out here. And I'm not even, that's not what this message is about, but it makes it very clear that if Jesus Christ is not the preeminent uh, person, the foundation stone upon which this structure is built, it's not of Him. It's not recognized by Him. It will burn. It won't even get there. It won't make the judgment. It won't even make the cut to get to the Bema to make the judgment. There's only one. The foundation isn't New Testament ethics. It's not history. It's not tradition. It's not debates and discussions that various teachers throughout church history have had. The foundation is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. And all that He is, His person and His work, that's the foundation. And that's the foundation that you're building on. If you're a believer today, it's already been laid. It was laid the moment you trusted Jesus Christ. Your foundation was already in place. And you started building. We started building. The foundation of Jesus. He said in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. What rock? Himself. Principle two. Principle two. There is but one type of material the believer should build with. Look at verse 12. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Now what we have here, when I say there's but one type of material the believers should build with, we have eternal uh, material that's in view. That's what he wants us to build with. We had a, a guy, a, a pastor, I can't remember if it was in a lecture series or what it was, but I remember this statement and I actually wrote it down. Uh, F, and a guy was preaching in chapel. And he said this. He said, we shouldn't build shacks upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that had such an impact upon me. Because think who it, who it is that we're building upon. And he said, we shouldn't build, we shouldn't build shacks. See, the idea that if I just get in isn't good enough if you understand the foundation. If we understand the foundation that, he's, that has been laid, then we should be looking to build a, 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 a literal skyscraper for His glory. Or, or whatever we can build to the, to the greatest possible extent of our ability as given by His grace. We should do all we can with it because that's the foundation as Christians we have the most perfect and immovable foundation in the world and the question for you and I is simply that what types of materials are we going to build with the materials in view here are in verse 12 they are in two categories the first gold silver precious stones these represent the highest quality they're the highest quality materials. The second category, wood, hay, and straw. These represent the inferior quality. That which will not last. Now the question is just exactly what do these materials represent? Because that's really the issue. What is the... What, what, we know he's speaking in an, in an analogy 
So what is he talking about? We need to know if we're going to build right, right? That's the, the idea. So we want to know just exactly what they represent. Well, they do not represent wealth, talent, spiritual gifts. That's not what they represent, these things. The materials represent the believer's responses to what they have. What's been given us. You get that? We've been blessed with the power of, of a resurrection, a resurrected Christ, given the Holy Spirit of God, given spiritual gifts, given talents, placed in churches to grow so we can go out and be used for Him, not for us. It's not about us. I wish we could get away from this. We're so caught up in our own little world and me, 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 me that it, the whole church has been turned on its ear to where if it's not about me and what I get, I'm moving on. I'm not going to fix things. I'm not going to stay here and help with this or in my own life, I'm going to bail on the Lord in this area. We can't do that. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about Him. What we do with what He's given me. He's given you great things. Every one of us. We're going to move through here. You're going to see. You have spiritual gifts. We need to identify. You need to identify those. And the, the reality is, is that God's not holding out some secret code and going to send you something that you can figure this out. He's given you the Word. He said, step in the offering plate and offer your body as a living sacrifice, and the will of God will be revealed as it relates to the spiritual gifts in your lives. I want you to know, why would I give you a gift for my service to be used unto my, His glory, and, and you live in the dark as to what that is? That just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. He wants us to know. So these, these represent are ultimately what we build with in our lives and in, in, in our works, our deeds for Him is what the materials represent. Listen, we're not saved by our works and, and we need to understand that and I want to make sure everybody's clear on that. We're not saved by our works or our deeds nor do we stay saved by our works. But we all have been created, it says, in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. So we're supposed to be out here living a life of good works and that's building upon the building. Now what type of materials are we using? Or works are we doing for the Lord? Imperishable work or perishable? The quality of the materials we use can be known by our motive, we're told. What's our motive? As we do think, what's our motive? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Our conduct. We can, we can, we can assess the material by our conduct. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, that plays into it. And our service, the use of our spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll get to that. The question is, is are you building a yard barn on the foundation of Jesus Christ or are we trying to build an Empire State Building? You say, well, I, I don't think I can pull off an Empire State Building. Probably not, nor can I. But we ought to try to build one, the, the best one we possibly can for His glory. You know, a lot of people say it doesn't matter, but it does. And when we get there, it, it, it's really going to matter. But at that point, it's already been settled. We've already been given the opportunity. And it's what we've done here. But let's go on. This brings us to this third principle, and that is this. There will be a building inspection. And look at verse 13. Each man's works, or each man's work, I should say, will become evident. And that's important too. Did you see that? Each man's work, not plural. 
Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So what's that tell us? There's going to be an inspection of the building. The work we've done. And the inspector is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know if if you've ever built, by the way, this analogy fits perfectly because there are inspections that occur and Tazewell County just implemented a bunch of them uh, in, in their building codes, but there are inspections that occur throughout the building process. From, there's a foundation inspection, there's a, a, a framing inspection, there's a plumbing ins- expe- inspection, there's an electrical inspection. I mean, right, you know, all the way through it. Does it meet code? Well, this analogy speaks to the reality that for us, there's an inspection as well of the work that we've done. And when an inspector comes in, he sees whether or not this is done right and with the right material. And if it's not, you, you don't get past. You, 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 you're, that, that will not make the grade. It has to be redone. Well, in this regard, the analogy doesn't fit because there's not a redo. With a building, I can re, you know, fix it. The inspector tells me i got to fix it. But the reality here is there's no fixing it. See, he's going to look at our building. And he's going to, it's going to be tested by fire. And the, I envision it just that way. You can keep it with analogy. If you build with, with brick and you build with stone and you build with metals and precious stones and all of these things and you build with wood, hay, and straw and you're throwing that in there in the course of your life, you put a wing on at one point in your life and you, you did it all in the flesh, and you think you, you know, it's gonna, you're going to present this life, this building which is Dan Larimore, before him. And, and here's my life, my world, and he's gonna, it's going to pass through the fire of his judgment. And, I'm, and half of that structure may be all that remains. Or it could all burn. Because everything I did was in the flesh. And for Dan Larimore. And any one of you can insert your name. And that's the point. Is Am I doing this for the Lord? Am I using and doing for the Lord? What am I building with? Am I looking to to see this pass through the fire? And I think a lot of people are going to be surprised because great edifices have been built upon the flesh. Great things in a world view and even what we as humans would consider good things have been done for the wrong motives. And if that's my life and I present it, those things that we thought would remain burn. And with that comes a real sense of loss. There's real loss. Let me give you some examples. Let's say visitation. Visiting people. Visitation done because of compulsion, where you're like, I gotta go do this, or I, I got, you know, I have to go see this person, and, and, and you're you're under compulsion to do it. I would say that that that's wood, but visitation done from a heart that loves the Lord and loves the people of God and loves humanity and wants to to, to live the gospel before others. I'd say that's gold. That's gold. Humbly enduring trials for the glory of God. Going through whatever trials, but not with a woe is me mentality, but how am I going to get through this and love my Lord and and be a witness for Jesus Christ in the midst of it? I'd say, that's silver. But if I go through the same trials with, with just on a pity kick all the way through it, Whining and complaining, I'd say, that's hey. It's not going to last. Or giving. Giving. Out of, out of obligation or, or, or pressure. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to do this. Huh. Boom. I'd say that that's straw. 
It's gone. But giving out of a cheerful heart that wants to see the Lord's work prosper and go forward for His glory, that's precious stones. See? You see what I'm saying? You can parallel this all throughout every part of your life. It's what we're building with. And we're building this building, this structure that will be scrutinized in its elements as to what we built with. And what remains, we're, record, we're, we're rewarded positively. And what is burned up that we thought we were going to be rewarded for, there's a real sense of loss. And believe me, it is real. It's spoken of in, in real words. And, I, and it's all over. But understand, what makes it through the fire comes down to you and I and, and what we're going to do with it, with the knowledge we have, what He's given us. The choice to live for Him and how we live for Him. Principle four, and, and, and it's uh, kind of couched in here, but it's definitely here. And this is the final one of these principles. And it speaks to, there are three types of builders that, in, in here. Uh, when we look at these verses here, look at 14 through 17. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. This isn't purgatory or anything like that. That's not what's here. What it's saying is, you didn't do much at all with what God gave you. Period. It's the guy who's standing knee deep in ashes because the structure went up in flames because he built with wood, hay, and straw. All of it. And so he's not, the salvation isn't the case here because he's saved. It, it says he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. He'll come through it, the fire, he's still saved, but there's a real loss there for him. Do you not know that you are the temple, a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. There's three type of builders in view here. The first one is the constructive builder, or the one who receives reward. He's the rewarded builder of verse 14. These are the believers who have the right motives in life, they're going through life, the right conduct, they're living in obedience to the Lord, they're effective in their service for Him because it's for Him, it's not about them, it's for the Lord, and they build with gold, silver, and precious stones in keeping with the analogy, and the result is, is they're going to be rewarded. And I believe there will be a lot of reward there, a lot of it. A lot of people will receive reward. Then there's the worthless builder, or the one, the losing builder, I call him. He's, he's, not, he's going to lose in the end. He's going to suffer loss, and he's in verse 15. This is the worker who is a, a Christian. There's, is the issue of his standing as redeemed or, or unsaved, it's not in, in view here. He's a Christian, but who does, does all the work according to the flesh. He builds with wood, hay, and, and uh, straw. And uh, there are many, as I said, there are many who build this way. And, and, and the, 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 the scrutinizing eyes of the Lord will expose and make manifest the quality of the materials with which He built with. And He will lose if He's built according to His flesh. And we get into that more, the motives in our next uh, message. But salvation is not the issue. And then there's the destructive builder of 16 and 17. And these are the non-believers that do their work inside and outside the church, but their work is destructive. These ultimately uh, are not rewarded at this judgment, nor are they here. They're at the white throne. They're at the white throne where they are destroyed in the lake of fire. 
But, but the issue here for us is this. The day of inspection is coming, folks. We're starting a new year. Why not start it with a rededication of your purpose for life? That I'm, gonna, I'm going to determine to make this year not about me, but about Him. About being used for Him and putting a wing on my building or another floor on my building that's built with the, the superior quality materials that, that last for eternity. That come through the, 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 the eyes of the Lord. His test with flying colors. And that we can be rewarded accordingly. This inspection day is coming. And the only time that you and I have to build is right now. You're building right now. As long as you have breath, we're building. We're building for the Lord. The judgment seat of Christ, listen, as I look at this, oftentimes I feel like I come away looking at it in a negative way. But you know what? If it's negative, it's because of how we're building. You get that? If, if the judgment, if, if looking ahead to you or I is a negative thing, as I look at the Bema, it's because of how and with what I am building. The judgment seat of Christ should be a time of rejoicing and reward. And you say, why is that? How do you know that? I'm going to tell you how I know it. By what He's given us. He gave us everything we need to come into that experience being rewarded. Looking at His coming with joy rather than shrinking back as it speaks of in, in that one verse in John, 1 John, in shame at His appearing. We only need to be ashamed if we're building shacks with wood, hay, and straw. But if we're living for the glory of the Lord, then we're building with gold and silver and precious stones, and they will endure the test, the inspection. But you've been empowered to come into that experience for His glory, fully rewarded with a rejoicing heart. Each one of us. So it shouldn't be negative. That's why I want us to come out of here, not out of here, I ain't going to get anything. I'm going to be knee deep in ashes. And I'm not saying that negative because I've been there. It's a good thing to, to not want to be there. But what, what ought to happen is not stop there. What am I going to do to change that? It's all in whether I'm going to continue to build with wood, hay, and straw, or I'm going to start picking up gold, silver, and precious stones. I'm committing my year ahead. I want it to be a time of real pro productive building for the glory of the Lord. And I pray that that's all our hearts. That we want to, we want to build for His glory. And ultimately be rewarded accordingly. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for your word and texts like this that challenge us, Lord, in, in, in our innermost uh, thoughts, heart, Lord, uh, where we're at. It, it speaks to the real issues of life. And I pray that every aspect of our lives, that this year we would be factoring Christ into the equation from the workplace to the, the, the parenting, the home, the, the, the whatever, the school, wherever we find ourselves, may we realize that we're building, that we're, we're, we're building every moment that we live, we're building for, for the Lord, hopefully, because the day will ultimately declare the quality of each of our our, our structures. 
So I pray that this would be a wake-up call in this, as, we're, as we're approaching the new year, Lord, that it would be a wake-up call going forward and that we would live in, in a way to where we would have uh, structures, our lives that would glorify you and ultimately we could hear from you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bless each one this day for being out, Lord. I'm thankful for, for everyone. And again, we lift our brothers and sisters up who are in all, in all of all the folks, Lord, who are struggling with sickness and flu and just ask that you'd be with them th this day and, and get them through this time as well. But just bless uh, the week uh, ahead going forward, Lord. May we be used for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.